energy is contagious. Uh, he, when he reaches you, he often pulls you into many of his explorative activities that he's involved in and really looks to not just connect with you, but educate his community. I have known Lincoln for over 10 years in a professional environment, as well as now we no longer work with one another at autotrader.com, uh, but we now share a great mentoring relationship and Lincoln was one who said, Audra, you keep telling me that you want to work on business development and you want to work on the next phase in your life. And we have great conversations, but how are you going to move that forward? And um, I, I, I kind of stammered and I said, well, I, I'm ready now. I'm ready to take some next actions, actionable steps to reach greater understanding in myself as a person, enhance my emotional intelligence and set goals that complement what are my best skills. And so he said, Audra, we need to take the profile, the emotional intelligence profile, and really talk about what that says about who you are and your strengths and set some actionable goals to help you move forward in your life and your career uh, with your colleagues, with your family. And so we did just that. Lincoln mentioned we had a session about a month ago and um, we really, he, he, he put the onus on me to take the action, to take the assessment, which I'm proud to say that that happened. He then sat down in a concentrated session via Zoom, so safe, and really spent the time to walk through the assessment and ask me what I've, what I noticed out of it. And as well as at the end said, so now let's talk about your actionable steps forward to further your, your life and your presence in your life. And so since then, I have certainly engaged with um, greater community groups in Atlanta. Um, I have really recognized um, during these stressful times of COVID um, where my, my own personal behaviors may not have been uh, suiting those around me and, and took, taken steps to correct those. And it truly is because of uh, Lincoln's engagement and involvement um, that I feel that I am now well balanced in what is the next steps I need to take during this stressful time quarantine. So with that said, um, an introduction of Lincoln, phenomenal Lincoln, and a testimonial of the experience I had going through the assessment. And I strongly encourage others to take some time to really dial into yourself, recalibrate, and prepare for those next challenges you have for yourself in life. Thank you, Audra. You know, when I asked Audra to, to introduce me, she asked me for a script. And I said to her, surprise me. You know me, surprise me. And you exceeded my expectations. Thank you, Audra. Thank you for that wonderful, amazing, you know, recommendation. Um, I see Brian Bunch is here, welcome. Welcome, Brian. Uh, would you um, unmute Thank yourself? You. Yeah, I'm here. Good. Welcome, um, Onella. Welcome, Onella. Hi, good night. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And um, where are you dialing from? 
I am from Tobago. Oh, welcome Tobago. And um, Brian, what city are you in? I know you're in from in here in your, in the US. Yeah, I'm in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Oh, good place. You know, Brian, the first time I heard of the name Chattanooga, I thought that was a fairy tale name. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> but then I found out that it's, it's for real. So welcome every, everybody. And again, Audra, thank you for that wonderful, amazing um, recommendation. And I'm going to share my screen again. Uh, we were here. Share the screen. Okay. So that was the first item on our agenda for tonight. Second item is we're going to get into social and emotional intelligence at the end of the night. I hope that you would have a, a clearer understanding of what social and emotional intelligence is all about. We're going to talk a little bit about what's the difference between emotional quotient and, emo and intelligence quotient. And then we will review the four quadrant model that Audra was sharing with you, which is made up of 26 distinct competencies that measures who you are and how you behave. We will share a little bit about a business case, meaning the value of this tool when it's used in businesses and even in personal health and wellness case, then we will have some question and feedback in the mean and answer. But the group is small enough, there are only 20 something of us. So feel free at any time to, feel free at, at any time to stop me and ask questions or make a comment. In fact, I might be, I will be encouraging you to make comments and provide feedback, okay? Those of you who have been in my workshops in the past would know that that's just my style. So are we ready? Yes. And, and yes. How, you, how are you feeling right now? If, if you would have, there was one word to describe how you're feeling right now, what would that would be? Relaxed. Relax, I like that. Somebody is, is relaxed. Anybody else? Expectant. Expectant. Thank you, Butchel. Anybody else? How are you feeling? I know you have feeling you're alive. So what are you experiencing? What kind of feelings you're experiencing right now? Right now in this moment. Anticipa anticipation, sir. Anticipation, okay. Anybody else? I'm feeling good. Yes. Feeling yes. Like going from un the unknown and hopefully I will get to know what I'm here for. All right, we're gonna take you from the unknown to the known. <laughs> yeah, anybody else? How are you feeling right now? You know, they say that 80% of how we behave is impacted by how we feel. 80% of how we behave is impacted by how we feel. So it's important to know your feelings. Okay, I want to give you a little bit of, not too much background on the Institute for Social and Emotional Intelligence profile, which is the institute that I am certified with. And this organization, the Institute for Social and Emotional Intelligence is an international learning and research, research organization supporting life coaches, executive coaches, and HR professionals as they bring social and emotional intelligence into the workplace and life beyond work. So this is not going to be limited just to organization and work, but your personal life. The, the Institute for Social and Emotional Intelligence provides certification in this use of social and emotional intelligence. I was certified in back in 2013. So I've been doing this for seven years. I love it. The most comprehensive, fully validated and statistically reliable social and emotional intelligence assessment instrument in the market today. There are instruments that focus on IQ and you can get a lot of free test your IQ. You know, and some of us like to do that. And then 
There are those that focus on emotional intelligence, but this is one of the few tools that put the two together. And we'll talk about what happens when you separate them. Based on the latest research, models of social and emotional intelligence and the ones in use by over 75% of Fortune 500 companies, the social emotional intelligence profile is being used by coaches around the globe. And if any one of you at the end of this discussion would like to get information on how to get certified, I, I can provide that information for you, okay? All right, so this happens when you, come on, okay, there we go. The first thing I like for you to do is to take a blank piece of paper and on the top of the blank piece of paper, write the word great, the two words, great ideas. You're gonna hear something tonight, one or two ideas and you're going to say, wow, that's a great idea. I should do that. Or you might say, you know, I used to do that and I stopped doing that. I need to start back doing that. Or it might even be something, I need to stop doing this. So, and at the end of the night when we are done, that could be the most valuable piece of paper you leave with. So can you promise me, give me a thumbs up that you would do that exercise with us tonight and for your own benefit. Thank you. Okay, your mind is like a parachute. It's not much good unless it's open. So if you come to a session like this with a closed mind, you're going to leave just as how you came. Nothing new, no learning, no development. You would have wasted an hour, hour and 15 minutes of your life. So I'm encouraging you to have an open mind. Yolanda, would you read that for me? Yolanda? Do what you've always done. You will always get what you always got. Thank you. You know the psychologists say it's insanity to do the same thing over and over again and expect different results. It's insanity. And I've been in many organizations and meetings when you bring up a new idea, the first thing that come, comes out of some people's mouth is, oh, we don't do things that way. Or we've never done it that way. Or that's not how we do things. And they're not open to trying new ways. So, if, But if you always do what you've always done, you always get what you always got. I hope all of you who are on this, this webinar tonight are open-minded and ready to try something different and something new. Um, Audra, would you read this for me? Audra, are you yes. still here? Okay, would you read that for us? What we get out of any activity is equal to what we put into it. Thank you, Audra. Now this time is an activity. You know, and what you get out of this activity is equal to what you put into it. What are some of the things that you can put into this activity so that you can get a lot out of it or the most out of it? Anybody? Response, feedback. Response, feedback. Thank you, Deborah. Anybody <laughs> else? Willingness to, um, to, to be receptive to ideas and thoughts and what is put forward. Thank you, Gita. Anybody else, what do, okay, we've all been to school, we've all, some of us, the universities, and what do great learners do? What are some of the habits of a great learner? Ask questions. Ask questions, thank you, Brian. You know, I have a, a questioning technique seminar and it's only 10 seconds and, and it's, um, let me do it for you in 10 seconds. Look at how the Lord designed you and me. Two ears, one mouth, which is a subtle indication that we should listen twice as much as we speak. You should listen twice as much as we speak. Anything else? I've heard, you know, ask questions, be engaged. Well, what else? What do great learners do? Listen, what else? Practice. 
practice who yeah be be ready you know when you hear something you say i can't wait to start doing that yeah what reading, else reading reading follow up research yeah thank you mike anybody else what else do great learners do why do you think i ask you to take a blank piece of paper and write great ideas at the top Great learners take notes. You know, the psychologists of learning will tell you that there is a link between your brain and your handwriting. We tend to remember what you write down on a piece of paper more than what you type or what just you think about. But when you write something down, there's a tendency for you to remember that more than when you just, you know, even if you type it. And you know, nowadays, unfortunately, people are doing a lot of texting and a lot of typing, but are not enough writing. But so take notes. Okay, anything else before we move on? All right. So emotional intelligence prior to 1995 was kind of behind the scenes, was in academia and the we know limited to the psychologists and the psychiatrists and the practitioners who did it. But in 1995, Daniel Goldman wrote the book, Emotional Intelligence. It's a blockbuster, bestseller. And then in the same year, um, a, a article on emotional intelligence came up in Time Magazine by Nancy Gibb. You know, that article got more exposure than the book. It got more exposure than the book. And if you would like to have a copy of that article uh, after the, at the end or later, tomorrow, whatever, just send me an email and say, Lincoln, send me the Time Magazine article. And I will know what you're talking about. Because I don't believe in dumping information on people. Because I, be, I, I want, you, if you request something, that you're going to use it. So if you would like a copy, just let me know. Okay. Then, if you Google or go on Amazon and put emotional intelligence in there, you will get fourteen, approximately fourteen thousand links. It becomes so well known and so popular. And you know, when they write a book for dummies, it hit mainstream. Emotional intelligence for dummies, you know, it's hit mainstream. So that's a little where we are with emotional intelligence today. Any questions? Any thoughts? Any comments? How are we doing? How are you feeling? Are you still feeling excited and anticipated? Yeah. Expectant? Yeah. All right. I don't want you falling asleep on me now. I know it's. <laughs> so, which is more important, emotional quotient or intelligent quotient? Anybody want to take a shot at that question? Which is more important? I um, I don't know if if one is more than important and and the, than the other. I think they both impact each other. Very good. Oh. That's the answer I was looking for. They do. It can't, one cannot do without the other. It's like having a doubles without China, you know, <laughs> and, and to my American friends, you know, that's a popular dish in, in the mm -hmm. island. It's, it's like, you can't have bacon without eggs kind of deal, you know, they go together, emotional intelligence, they, none is, neither one is more important than the other. So emotional intelligence plus Intelligent quotient equals success. When you put them together, you get success, you know, in all aspects of your life. But what happens when you subtract, when you take away the emotional intelligence and you only focus on the intelligent quotient, what do you think happens? Any, any thoughts about that? When people who act as if they have no emotional intelligence and they all focus on the academic, no people skills. What happens? Cold, hard world. Cold, hard world. Yes, people. You know, I believe in my heart of heart. 
all this rioting that's going on in the world today, I believe 80 to 90% of the people who leave their home, they went to protest. They did not go to riot, but they get there and they get caught up in the emotions of the situation and they end up doing things that they can't believe afterward. I can't believe I did that because they, they, they did not have that sweet spot of managing their behavior. And that's what we're gonna talk about, one of the things we're gonna talk about tonight. So out of control emotions make smart people stupid. <laughs> As I show you some of this, I'm sure you'll be thinking, oh, I know somebody who's like that. You know, uncontrolled emotions make smart people stupid. They always, you know, screaming at people. You know, they have a high IQ, a lot of book sense, but no people skills. And then you have this, you know, the bully and the tyrant is no longer limited to the playground. They're in offices now, they're in buildings, they're even in churches, you know? And some of them are not even aware of their behavior. And then you have the micromanager. How many of you just love to work for a micromanager? Anybody just love working for a micromanager? You know, I've never met a person yet who just love working for a micromanager, who is you know, always over your shoulder and uh, always over your shoulder and questioning everything you do and always criticizing. And then you have the angry and the hostile. You know, you know some people, they always seem to be angry at the world always seem to be angry. And finally, you have the emotionally immature and they're all around us. They're all around us and we recognize it. And, and again, I'm, I'm sure as, I'm, as I show you these four characters, you can call out people, but please no name calling, okay? So, but just to, to show, the, to prove the reality that these people exist. And unfortunately, they're not even aware, most of them, of the impact they're having on, the, on even themselves and the people around, around them. Any questions, comments? All right. So the impact on employees. Yes? Mr. Kukura? Yes. Mr. Kukura? Yes. All right. Um, can I ask a question? Of course, I, I, I welcome questions. All right. All right. So we say, you know, um, you have all these different people who um, behave like that, right? But, you know, it is, is it possible that some of them and uh, some people believe that if you, if you, that there's <clears throat> maybe the place for emotion is not in certain places because it might take away from efficiency and, um, I'm not saying that I'm a believer, I'm saying <laughs> that it could, no, certainly not, yeah. that um, it could be a people, a, a, a sense of, of that kind of, of, of belief um, or basic thinking. Well, of course, we perform how, what, uh, based on what we believe. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's so important to get to know more about this, you know? get to know more about it is so important and we will prove that, and I think it was you Gita who said, emotional intelligence and intelligence makes a better world, makes a better world. So employees, uh, you know, they're checking out. They're just checking in, they don't wanna be there anymore. And they're looking for another job somewhere. Some of them might even say, take me out of this place. You know, I can't take it anymore. Because who likes to work for a bully or a tyrant or so somebody is always angry? And what happens, we will learn later, is when you have people like that, they don't get all from their people. They get just enough or even okay. Then you have people stressed out at work. You know, only a couple of days ago, I got, I got an article in my inbox and they said that stress is responsible for about, for about six or eight chronic diseases. Heart attack, diabetes, cancer starts with stress. 
This tool will equip you to manage, to be aware of your stress and to manage your stress. And then you have the people who just checked out. They just checked out. Picking up a paycheck and not performing, doing anything. And you have the one who quit. And the boss is saying, what? How come he quit? He was such a good worker. Yeah, you drove him away. You drove him away. And it impacts the bottom line. Because when people are not producing what they're being paid to produce, what happens? Expenses go up, profit goes down, and impacts the bottom line. So you, we will learn later that that's why a lot of companies, big companies, you know, adapt, adopt this program. So, oh, by the way, Gita, my name is Lincoln, okay? Call me Lincoln. I will. Yeah. In a survey of a thousand American workers back in 2012, look at that number percentage. 65%, oh my goodness, chose a new boss over a pay rise, 65%. And then 60% said they would do a better job if they had a better relationship with their boss. 47% say their boss does not stay calm and in control. And 31% feel uninspired and unappreciated by their boss. You know, appreciation is one of the key motivators to us human beings. I learned a long time ago that appreciation and recognition should be served like champagne mm -hmm. while it's still bubbling in the moment. You want people to perform well, catch them performing well, recognize them, and they will. Fortunately, I've been blessed to travel all over the world, except, you know, Africa, and that's a common quality of all people, a common characteristic. You could come from China, you could come from Hong Kong or Indonesia or wherever you come from, from Jamaica, you know, appreciation is a key. And bosses who can recognize that get most or more out of their people. 20% say their boss has little or no integrity, which is a key social and emotional intelligence competency. And we talk more about that in, in a minute. And then 73% in, in their 30s and in their 20s and their 30s said their, is that their health is at stake due to a bully boss. And you know, there are cases of people suing companies for stress. And the current situation is costing $360 billion in lost productivity. Lincoln, and this, yes. Let me ask a question. Why do you yeah. think these numbers are, are so high? Is, is this something that's a, um, that's a learned phenomenon that people go through. I mean, you get a boss like that, you grow up, grow up, and uh, and uh, think that that's the way business is run, and you take that into to your business, you take that into effect when you go into it. Mike, that's a really good question. That's why we're doing this. That's why we need to expose more people to this, and lack of training, and awareness. You know, you know, it, we, we have become so re, we are naturally reactive people, but people who are aware have learned to hit the pause button. And we'll talk more about that, but that's a good question. And a very pertinent question at this time. So a USA Today snapshots say what makes good employees quit? Some of the top reasons. Unhappiness with management, 35%. Limited opportunities for advancement, 33%. Lack of recognition, 13%. Inadequate salary and benefits, 13%. Being bored, 1%. Thank God only 1% one, only 1 will be in board. But look at the high unhappiness with management, 35%. That's more than three out of every 10 people, 35%. This is impactful, people. We need this. So the key, or at least a help to all of this situation, to these issues and challenges is social and emotional intelligence. And it starts with an assessment and awareness. And it includes training programs, my, Mikey were talking about these training programs, but individual development programs and coaching 
and introducing the concept into the culture. Now, cultures, wherever you are, don't just ha happen. They either they evolve and they whatever, whatever anything goes, or they are trained, managed, and led. It's like, you know, a company has a brand. It's their brand that was trained, what they are known for, you know, what they are known for, you know, like um, Chick-fil-A in the United States. When you hear the word Chick-fil-A, for those of us in the United States, what's the first thing that comes to mind? My pleasure. My pleasure, yeah. <laughs> With my pleasure. And anywhere you go, everyone, and they give you whatever, my pleasure. You know, with pleasure. You know, and it's so consistent. And that's why they're the most successful fast food restaurant in the whole wild world today. And they're going international. They're going international. My, that's their brand. That's their brand, what you're known for, your culture, the organization, churches. You know, unfortunately, my, my, my church that I grew up in, the Presbyterian church, you know what they're known for? The chosen frozen. <laughs> and we need to throw them out. We need to throw them out, Rev. You know, we need to help them to get more, more passionate about their faith and their belief and their walk. And that's a culture that was indoctrinated in us from the beginning. I mean, but if we can change, we will learn that we can change that. Hey, Robert, you want to say something? I guess not. So, social emotional intelligence is not just limited to feelings and fuzziness and warmth and all. It has to do with personal power, and personal power has to do with self confidence, not strength and bullying, but self confidence, integrity. And Hey, Robert, would you kindly mute yourself? Thank you. Personal power, integrity, you know, building bonds. Bonds just don't happen. Build and building trust. If you've ever, you know, I know many of us have never been to NASCAR, but we see it on TV. Notice when that driver comes into the pit, does he get out of the car? Does he check on everybody to see they're doing what they're supposed to do? No, he trusts them to do everything that they're supposed to do. And in seconds, he's gone again. Trust, trust. Think about it in, an, in an operating room. The doctor, when he puts his hand out and say, hand me a scalpel, he trusts that assistant or that nurse to hand him the right tool. Building trust in any relationship. Trust is key to any relationship. Would you agree with that? Hello? Yes. Thank you. Absolutely. Yes. Um, Birchell, would you read this for me, please? Sure. The business of developing leaders. Emotional intelligence is much more powerful than IQ in determining who emerges as a leader. IQ is a threshold. Competence is a threshold competence. You need it, but it doesn't make you a star. Emotional intelligence can. <laughs> Mike, that answers some of your questions. And Gita, that answers some of your questions. IQ is, we need it. But how you treat people, that's what makes you a star. And many of us, we work with leaders who just can get the most out of people. They, can, they have strong people skills and they're aware of it. Um, Gita, would you read this for me? What is emotional intelligence all about? A working definition. Gita? Okay, Yolanda, would you read this for me? Yes. Oh, thank you, Yolanda. Social and emotional intelligence is the ability to be aware of our own emotions and those of others in the moment, and to use that information to manage ourselves and manage our relationships. 
Notice I underline in the moment and I put it in caps. Because once a moment is gone, it's gone, you can't get it back. You know, in the computer, if you send an email, you can recall it within a certain time. A spoken word, you can't recall it. It's said in the moment. People who are more aware of their emotional intelligence are able to manage their, what they say, what they think, or their actions in the moment. And that's a key in the moment. Would you agree with that, people? Yes. Yes, Thank certainly you. do. Thank you. So this is a picture of the, a human being and how we made up. We all have genetics. And let me ask you, how many of you have been told, oh, you're just like your father or you're just like your mother? <laughs> you know, we all have genetics and that's our makeup. Our genetics are formed in us while we're still in our mother's womb. We can't change that. I will always be skinny, you know? I will always be dark, darker than my sisters kind of deal. So that's our genetics, it can't change that. And then we have our personality and you know, they say that our, the psychologist will tell you your personality, your morals, your values, what you stand for is developed from age zero to about seven, mm -hmm. your personality. And every one of us have a, you know, we might have similarities in our personalities, but we have a distinct personality. Think about those of you who have children and you have more than one. They grew up in the same house. They went to the same church. They come out of the same womb. They went to the same elementary school and, you know, but they're so different. Personality and then behavior. So our personality and the environment that we grew up in will impact our behavior. So my computer is not working, not advancing the slide now. What's going on here? Okay. All right, the environment and your personality impacts your behavior. And I wanna tell you a, a true story. I grew up in, in Trinidad and Tobago I left Trinidad and Tobago at age 35. And we are known to be friendly people. You know, everybody knows everybody. You wave at everybody. You say good morning. You say good evening. In 1995, I come to America and in, I'm living in Miami and I'm in an elevator and there are like about eight or nine people standing in the elevator right next to me and nobody says anything. <laughs> and I'm wondering what's wrong. I know I took a shower this morning you know, and everybody looking at the numbers to see what floor they're going to get out of. Environment. And then, you know, th that, that community is made up of so many different cultures and nationalities. It's like, so chaotic. I moved from Miami after living there for 10 years. And you know what? I decided I am not going to fall in line with that culture. I am going to say hello to everybody. I'm going to wave. And I've, uh, the, when I first started started doing that, they would look at me and they wonder, what is he drinking? Or what is he smoking? <laughs> or what is he on? And then finally they get it and I start getting feedback and you know, in, especially in my immediate environment. I go to Houston, Texas. I got promoted, relocated to Houston, Texas. Oh my God, what a different culture. The people were so friendly. My neighbor even cut my lawn for me, you know? So when we grew up, you know, you talk about the Midwest, even in the little island like Trinidad, people born in the, in Port, grew up in Port of Spain, they behave differently than the people who grew, who grew up in the South, right? And in, in, in Jamaica, the people from Montego Bay and Kingston, they behave different than the ones from Oterios. Right, Bachel? That is so true. Yeah, our environment impact our behavior and our personality, but you've got to be aware of it. Now you can't change your genet genetics. Your personality can be adjusted a little bit, but it's your behavior and you can change your environment and your behavior. And that's what people see. They don't see your genetics. They don't see your personality. They see your behavior and then that's how they judge you. Um, my Trinidad, friends and colleagues will remember many years ago, a Calypsonian named Valentino sang a Calypso and his 
words were something like, don't expect me to sing it, I'm not a good singer. But he said, life is a stage and every one of us have a role to play. And the thing is, we need to be aware of that. People are looking at you and they judge you by your behavior. So does that, that make you give you a good reason to manage your behavior? Does it? Mm -hmm. well, thank Definitely. You. Thank you. So, who are you? How many of you have been told you're an introvert or shy? Anybody? <laughs> Believe it or not, when I was in my early teens, they told me I was so, why are you so shy? <laughs> But that they know the introvert, and then quite you know a high percentage of our population are introverts, and then you have the extroverts, you know, and many of us have been told we're extroverts. Well, people, I learned a new term recently, and it's ambivert. And guess what? I have an article on how to be an ambivert, what's an ambivert, and how to become an ambivert. You know, it's that's, that sweet, that's the, the sweet spot between introvert and extrovert, ambivert. To be, know when to be, when to turn it down and when to turn it up and be an ambivert. And if you would like that article, again, just send me an email and I will send it to you. So that's the article number two. Anybody remember what was the first article? Anybody that I promise you? If you can't remember, you can't ask for it. The, the Time Magazine article, thank you. Ask for it already. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And I uh, know the ambivert article. Just, just put ambivert in, in the body of the, your email and I'll send it to you. Okay, any questions? Mm -hmm. And, and um, the guy who talked okay. about am, ambivert is uh, Dr. Travis Bradbury. Yes, Burchell. There is very interesting that uh, you speak about ambivert because many of us are. I know innately I am an introvert, mm -hmm. but based on what I have to do, I um, really have to step it up some in order to effectively do what has to be done. So you see, so many of us really yeah. practice um, both. We are not one or the other, we are a little of both. Amen. Thank you. And you know, the, the key is we're doing that naturally, but when we start to become conscious about it, it becomes more powerful and more intentional. Right now we subconsciously doing it, but when we become conscious about something, it's amazing. Now we're taking it to the next level. And now we, you know, before we just existing, now we're living. Now we're living life. So, if social you know, intelligence, a little historical background, IQ was the focus in the 1900s. And unfortunately, our school system is more focused on IQ development. You know, how to read, how to write, how to do math, you know, and all of learn French, learn Spanish, you know, all of that kind of stuff, IQ. Multiple intelligences were introduced in 1983 and then EQ, emotional intelligence in 1990, and social and emotional intelligence as recently as 2006. So that's the development. So we're getting there. So here is a little, and some of you might be acquainted with Howard Gardner's theory of multiple intelligences. And, and this is the third article I'm going to promise you. So you have three articles I promise you. The first one, somebody remind us, was Time Magazine article. The second was the Ambivert article. And the third is the Multiple Intelligence. So yeah, quickly, um, just give you a quick overview of, of these intelligences. Um, the verbal is uh, the ability to express yourself verbally. And you, know, and you know some people, they just seem to know what the right thing to say at the right time and how to say it. And then there are some people, you know, like they, they get dumb and they don't know what to say. And then the logical, mathematical, some people just seem to be so good at math, you know, and some are not so good. 
uh, the visual, spatial, you know, this has to do with looking at space and, and being able to manage it and make the best of it. And then musical. Now, musical is not limited to the ability to play a musical instrument or to sing a song. It has to do with much more than that. It has to do with rhythm. And those of you who have played sports, you know, you know, when you get into a zone or you get into a rhythm, things just go well. Things just go well. And then bodily kinesthetic, which has to do with body language, being able to, you know, express yourself. Because you know they said they say 70% of communication is nonverbal. 70% of communication is nonverbal. And then interpersonal. Interpersonal has to do with a knowledge of your own self. Intrapersonal has to do with the knowledge on how you manage your relationships with the people around you. Mm -hmm. Naturalistic is people who are, oh man, they can see nature and they get value out of nature and they enjoy nature. And then existentialistic, I can't say that word, but this is the futuristic thinkers of the world and the people who are always questioning what life is all about and purpose and all of it. I'm a little bit like that, but not to an extreme. So if you need the, the definitions of all of this, just in your email to me, ask for multiple intelligences. So you have three things that I can send to you. The Time Magazine article, the Ambivert article, and the multiple intelligences article. Okay, any questions? Any questions? You know, and this Howard Gardner, this is, very popular in universities. Any questions, comments? Are we still feeling great? Yes. Or are we feeling better? <laughs> more ex are you feeling more excited than when we first started? I have a question. Yes, Mike. Uh, yes, Michael. Um, these multiple intelligences, right? Mm -hmm. Um, how? What's the word I'm looking for? How? Um. How many can a person have? <laughs> all of it. M Michael, that's a good, but you can have all of it, but in different levels and different, you know, quantity levels. You know, some people, I mean, everybody can speak, right? Mm -hmm. Unless you're dumb. <laughs> but some people are just better at, you know, like public speaking, conversation you know, than others. Everybody know how to add one and one make two. But when it comes to the higher level of math, and some people have to work harder at it than others. You get what I'm saying? Right. That, so that, if, you, if you know does that your, if you know where you are, then you can work on certain parts. There you go. That's awareness. Start every it starts with awareness and admitting. You know, I, I will tell you something. My very first adult speech that I did. It was back in 1972, Richard, it was at the Port of Spain JCS meeting. I was doing, I remember the topic. I was doing project planning and implementation. And I had all my notes and everything, but my knees were shaking. I could not stand up. Fortunately, we are, I was able to sit behind a head table and my head was down, I was reading my notes. I went home that day, I was so embarrassed with myself. And I made a vow to myself that if I'm going to do this, that's not how it's going to be done. And I took action, joined the JSCs. I got a lot of opportunity to practice, but I took it to the next level. I took a course with Dale Carnegie, human relations and effective speaking. You, you know, so that's, why I've been, people say I'm, I'm good at what I do. You know, UPS paid me a lot of money earlier last year to deliver a keynote to, to their company. You know, Delta Airlines hired me to deliver a keynote to their company and that's just to name a few. I've been all over the US speaking, but it took effort and intention to answer your question, Michael. It wasn't me, but I had to work it out and develop it. Some people just say, well, it is what it is. It, it is what we make it out to be. Right. It is what we make it out to be. That's one of the biggest difference between the human being 
and every other creation. The Lord created us with free will to choose. Free will to choose. We can choose to accept things as they are, or we can choose to do something about it. We can choose to blame everybody else in the whole wide world, or we can choose to take ownership. So that's one of the, that's the biggest difference between a human being and every other creation. We can talk more about that. So the social emotional intelligence four quadrant model is made up of, you know, we have the self, others, and then awareness and management. So what we are proposing to people is that self-awareness leads to better self-management, more effective self-management. You know, and mm -hmm. other than social awareness lead to relationship management. So what does this all mean? Well, I'm gonna tell you, it's made up of 26 components. And in self-management, we have three components. In self-awareness, self sorry, we have three components. I'm gonna share this with you in a minute. And in self-management, we have 10 components. In social, other than social awareness, we have three and relationship management, we have 10. And each one is measured a score from zero to 15. Now, uh, a top score in this, an e high, the high, a perfect EQ score, SEIQ score is 390. I've, ne I've done hundreds of this. I've never met somebody with a perfect score. And the day I meet somebody with a perfect score, I will think this is Jesus Christ because we know he's the only one who is perfect. So let me share with you what these components are. Self-awareness starts with emotional self-awareness. And you know, we all subconsciously, we're in a situation and we feel fearful, we feel anxiety, you know, but the people who are aware of it are better able. And then you have accurate self-assessment. This is being, having a knowledge of it. It's no longer subconscious, it become conscious. And then personal power. And we, as I said earlier, personal power has to, does not have to do with, you know, bullying and being strong and powerful. It has to do with self-confidence and the ability to make things happen and to do things. Any questions? No, yes. So self-awareness, when you are aware, you know, now it's like, it's you like you have road signs. You know, how, how many of you, you know, you're, you're going to a, a new area and they have the road. Why do you think they put road signs? Cover ahead, you know, crossing ahead, railway crossing ahead, why? So you can manage the way you drive. You know, I like, I like the ways, the ways, Software program even tell me there's a cop up the road, up the street. Slow down, Lincoln. You know, so self awareness. It's like this tool is like road signs for you to manage your self behavior, self management. I mean, anybody here have heard of the Marshmallow Project? Anybody? Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about it, Richard? <laughs> you put a marshmallow in front of a little child and tell them, if you don't eat it for 10 minutes, I'll give you another one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and most of them will eat it straight away. Oh, well, look at these kids, man. You see, you know, this thing is a marshmallow. And then the, 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 the people who work with the psychologists came back in the room and they've tracked these young kids up to age 20, 25, 40 years old. And what they found out, those who waited, who got, first they got rewarded immediately with the two marshmallows, but their SAT scores were 200 points higher than the others. And their professions, you know, they were earning 33% more than the people who, those who did not wait. Patient, managing your behavior, hitting the pause button. So self-management has to do with behavioral self-control. Do you know anybody who always seems to be out of control? Yes. And they don't have to be drunk, you know. <laughs> 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 you 
And, and how many times have you have to tell somebody, control yourself, mm -hmm. control yourself, you know, and then integrity. I've never met a human being yet who has told me, Lincoln, I don't have any integrity. I've met a lot of people who claim that they have integrity, <laughs> but how they practice, and I have to, you need to go and learn what's the meaning of integrity, mm -hmm. you know, and it's a what you stand for, your word, your word, your values, your morals. You, you, you say you're going to do something, you do it. Here is a, a, a short, impactful definition of integrity. And I learned this from a, a guy named Alan Fine who wrote the book, You Already Know How to Great. Repeat after me, everybody. Unmute yourselves, everybody, and repeat after me. Say, do, co. Say, do, co. One more time. Say, say do, do co. co. Say do co. La last time. Say do co. Say do say co. co. And integrity is all about saying what you're going to do, do what you said you were going to do, and communicate when you can't. Because I mean, you're not a crook, so you had good intentions, and maybe something happened or maybe you just told somebody i'm going to meet you at the mall or whatever at so and so time but then you have a flat tire or, or somebody else you know your wife call you or your your spouse call you and so you have to they take priority but you don't just leave the people waiting wondering where is this guy you, and now with cell phone and you know all these communication tools we have tell them call communicate then people will understand that's integrity. Say, do, co. You are, I hope you're writing that down. And then innovation and creativity. I mean, look at what's happening in our world today. This COVID-19 virus thing has have come up with so much innovation and creativity. You know, this last Sunday, we had World Communion at our church and in all over the world, we had World Communion. And they gave us communion in a little cup plastic cup, on the top of the cup, there was the bread, like a little wafer, and in the, and there were two, you know, to take off the first, how you could, whatever, and you have the bread, and then the wine is under, what creativity? If we did not have the situation, we would not be creative like that. So sweet are the uses of adversity. And these people who are creative, they don't say, well, nothing, we can do nothing about this. No, they find a way. We all have a sense of creativity in us. And then initiative and bias for action. They don't, we don't have to be told. If something has to be done, we do it. It does not have to be our own, our job or in our job description. We do it. Initiative, bias for action. And then achievement drive. We don't settle for okay. God did not make okay people. Man. He made us in his image great. You were great, you're not okay. You know, you know, with all due respect to the guys who wrote the book in the 80s, I'm okay, you're okay. With all due respect to them, I'm here to tell you, you're not okay. <laughs> and I'm not okay. You are great, and I am great. You know, go be the best that you were designed to be. Don't settle for okay. And then realistic optimism. Prior to this, I was referred to as an optimist. But now I'm being more realistic about it. I'm being more realistic. So I'm not, I don't disappoint myself. I don't disappoint others. And it's giving me more peace, less stress, realistic optimism. Then you have resilience. Resilience. Amen. Looking, looking for a way. We find what we look for. If we look for a way, we will find it. And those of us who believe in Jesus know that he is our way maker. We can go to him when we can't find it. We can go to him. Show us the way, Lord. And then stress management. Talk about stress management earlier. You know, I know. yes, we talk about stress management earlier. Is there anybody here who does not have enough stress in your life and you want some more? <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't think so. You know, I didn't think so. But we need to be aware of the stress and manage the stress. And then personal agility. Personal agility has to do with the ability to adapt to change, to
to embrace change, yeah. to change the change, to make the most of the change. Last year, January, I got invited by UPS to speak on, to do a keynote. And the topic they gave me was coping with change. So I met with the VP of HR and I said to her, Terry, you know, can I change this topic a little bit? She said, well, what would you want to change it to? Very smart woman. I said, huh. the word coping is such a defeatist word. Can we change it to capitalizing on change? Because if we tell the people how to cope, they're not going to change. They're not going to do anything. But if we tell, teach them how to capitalize on the change, wow, we're going to get so much more done and so much more happier people in your company. She agreed and we had a blast. We had a blast. Change. Would anybody, would anybody disagree that we live in a changing world? That change has become a constant? We live in a changing I world. That and constant change is what contributes to stress. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you don't manage it. If you, if don't, you don't manage, manage it, well. it. Yes. Right. And then intentionality. Self-management. What's your intention? We achieve what we intend to achieve. We achieve what we intend to achieve. So those yeah. are the 10 components for self-management. Before I move on to the social and Social awareness. Anybody have any questions here? Uh, sorry, sir. I have to ask for an excuse. I have an emergency. I have to leave. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. I hope it's nothing too serious. Thank and, you. And something you can manage. Yep. Okay. All right. Be safe. Okay. Others on social awareness. Um, Aaron Freistein wrote a, a book, you know, the best corporate citizen, the hundred, you know, tools for the best corporate citizens has to do with empathy. Do we need to explain what empathy is to anybody? No. Simply put, walk in other people's shoes, walk in other people's shoes. And then situational organizational awareness. This has to do with being aware of the people around you, the, who are the go-getters, who are the people who get things done, and who are the lazy people being, you know, and they all exist, but being aware. And then service orientation, having a heart for serving your fellow man. You know, I'm a, I'm a life member of JC International. One of the tenets of our creed is service to humanity is the best work of life. Service to humanity is the best work of life. And anybody in any business or any organization, if you're not providing good service, people are going to leave. Yes. And they're not going to come back. Even, you know, in the church, if you're not providing a good service, they're going to leave and go somewhere else where they get better. Service orientation. So those are the three components on, other than social awareness. Any questions? Comments? Okay, now relationship management. Now we talk about self-awareness. We talk about self-management and we talk about social and other awareness. Well, those three sections all lead to relationship management. Great management relationships don't just happen. Great relationships need management needs effort, needs knowledge, needs being aware of. And you know what? We have all of us in this call and this webinar, we have a variety of relationships. Those who are married, we have a spousal relationship. Those who are parents, we have relationships with our kids. You know, those who have belong to a church, we have our church brothers and sisters. We have our neighbors. I mean, think about all the relationships that we have and it, take, it takes different you know, management. You go to the supermarket for the two or three minutes, you're talking to the cash register, the cashier, you have a relationship and opportunity to make a difference in that person's life. Relationship, but it takes management, being aware. Now look at the components. Look at the first one, 
communication, communication. In any relationship, it takes communication. Then you have interpersonal effectiveness, how you interact with other people. You have powerful influence and skill. And you know some people, they can get you to do anything. They mm -hmm. have the skill, powerful influence and skill. And you have conflict management. You know, we're going to have conflict no matter where we go. Unfortunately, we don't learn how to manage conflict unless, you know, we go to a conflict management workshop. But you know what I learned? In the Japanese school system, they teach their kids from young age conflict management. And they teach them, they give them, they use a pillow as a reference. And so they say on the top left, you're saying that you're right. On the top right hand corner, the other person is saying, no, I'm right. And then on the bottom left, we have both of you have come to the and say, well, we are both wrong. right. And then on the, on the right hand say, no, no, we are both wrong. And then in the middle, they say, it doesn't matter who is right and wrong. Let's put our minds together and, and our brains together, come up with the best solution. Amen. <laughs> come up with the best solution. What? If, if, you know, if more people in the world would approach conflict like that, we would not have all this crime and all this killing and all this name calling and, oh my God, you know? But it takes training and coaching and being aware. Then you have inspirational leadership. You know, people who can, they have to inspire people, not demand from people, but inspire them. And those people get more out of their people. Catalyzing change stimulating change. When something is not working, we need to change it. Building bonds. I mean, as I said earlier, relationships, building bonds is, is so important to have a relationship with your fellow man and woman. Friendships, you know, marriages, it's a bond. It's a bond. And there are so many of you here on this call who you, we have a bond. You know, Audra was sharing with you, Michael, Mike Brooks, you know, Michael Elliman, uh, we have a bond, Richard Deming, you know, we have, a, we've known each other for so long, and, you know, what happens if even no time, time passes and we haven't seen each other, but when we see it's as if nothing, no time had passed. Building bonds, it takes effort. Then teamwork and collaboration, we all know, we all know this, that when we perform as a team, we get more done, get more, and we are more successful. And you have coaching and mentoring others. You know, you don't have to have a title or be a boss or a manager or a president or a pastor to be a coach or a mentor. In fact, the same side-by-side -side coaching and mentoring is so much more effective than top-down. But again, mm -hmm. it takes skills and training to be able to do this. Building trust. We talked about this earlier. In any relationship, trust is the key in greed. Without trust, you don't have a relationship, people. Without trust, you do not have a relationship. Any questions? Um, Lincoln, I don't have a question, but uh, something that I've always felt is all this comes mm -hmm. down to one word, and that's respect. Respect, yeah. yeah. You can't trust somebody who you don't respect. Thank you, Brian. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Any other thoughts, comments? Nope, okay, let's move on. So the business case, you know, there is hard evidence that soft skills, you know, I prefer people skills, count anywhere you go, count and make a big difference. So social and emotional intelligence, you know, coaching and training, look at these companies that use this program, have introduced it to their company, to into their culture. And they've seen so much. And it's not only personal result, but financial result also. The bottom line is impacted. And just to give you an example, Sheraton Hotels, 900 hotels in 90 countries. You with over 150,000 associates. They introduce social and emotional intelligence, coaching, 
And the goal was to build a service culture, the hotel. Well, they increased market share by 24%. Would you like that for your company to increase your company's market share by 24%, 10%, 5%? You know, so it works. And you, everybody know Pepsi. Pepsi, social emotional program generated a 10, this is a worldwide company, 10% increase in productivity, 87% decrease in turnover, saving $4 million and over a thousand percent ROI. Now, you know, when you have to replace an employee, that costs money to replace an employee. It costs money. It adds to the cost. Then you have top reasons for executive derailment. Unfortunately, this happens. Poor interpersonal relationships. Sometimes I wonder how these people got promoted in the first place. Well, so unfortunately, we have this tendency to promote high performers without checking what kind of leadership skills they have, what kind of people skills they have. And then nothing happens and they wonder what happened here. Everybody is leaving. Single most common factor being too harshly critical. The insensitive or demanding alienating coworkers and direct reports, chasing them away. Because what happened to some people, they feel everybody should be like them. That's you know, what caused this harsh critical reaction. Then you have rigidity. They can't change. I had a friend, he owned a print tree. He had a sign on his desk, my way or the highway. You know, a lot of people took the highway. Inability to accept feedback about traits they need to change or improve. That's why 360 feedback programs are so effective and helpful. Inability to listen, learn, and change. And then you have the inability to work with a theme being disrespectful, you know, Brian talked about respect earlier, being uncooperative, my way or the highway, you know, not sharing information and plans or sharing credit. I'm sure you work with people who they take credit for everything and they don't give credit where credit is due. These are some of the reasons why top executives get stressed out and get replaced. And the personal health and wellness case, and that's Dr. Laura, Laura Belston. She is the person who developed this program. Uh, I was fortunate that she was the one who coached me and certified me. The health and wellness case said that people with positive emotions get fewer colds and illnesses. This is proven. Have fewer symptoms and suffer less pain when they do fall ill have lower risk of chronic disease, like heart disease, stroke, diabetes, immune disorders, and they live longer, positive emotions. And you know what? You can change your emotions. You can develop positive emotions with a little bit of coaching and a little bit of awareness. Other studies show that they earn more over the course of their lifetimes, about 33% more, is that a lot or what? 33% more. And then in relationship, have more satisfying relationship and enjoy more satisfying social networks, a key factor in longevity. You know, they did an experiment some time ago, a long time ago, with newborn babies. And they had a control group and an uncontrolled group. And in the uncontrolled group, they just left them alone, feed them when they were hungry, change them when they were crying. But with the control group, they held them a lot. And, if, and they tracked these kids, babies, when they became adult, and they found out that those who were held a lot, touched a lot, interacted with a lot, were so much more successful in, in their life. That human touch, that emotion, sharing of emotion is so key. So other personal benefits improve performance and achievement. More creativity and innovative problem solving better decision-making, more flexible thought process, and even improve memory. So when you learn to be aware of your 
emotions and you learn to manage it and aware of the other people, this is what some of the benefits. Social and emotional intelligence, friends, these compet competencies are measurable and learnable and that's what we get with the tool. They best learn through coaching and training. People are going to do what they are trained to do or coached to do. Now, you might, you know, think about it. Professional athletes who are so good at what they do, they all have a coach. Hello? Why? Because they need this coach to show them what they, where the mistakes that they make and show them how to correct the mistake. Nobody's perfect. And then I deal when integrated into the organizational culture, whatever the type of organization it is. I have done this for churches. Social emotional intelligence is a core skill set. And you know, a skill is something that can be learned and developed. That's the skill. And it's grounded in science. It's not just about feeling. Fuzziness is grounded in science and proven ROI. Proven ROI. Anybody starts with an, an awareness, an assessment. It's a collection of skills. Being aware of what's going on within us in the moment. Being aware of what might be going on within others and responding with care and consideration. Managing ourselves. You notice how often in the moment comes up? In the moment and managing our relationships with others, may I add, in the moment. So those are the collection of skills that you would learn if you decide to have your social and emotional intelligence profile done. And personal development plan. How many of you have a personal development plan that you're working on right now? Anybody? Some of the, for some of us, it's what we worked on. <laughs> what we worked on. <laughs> yeah, no, okay. It, it's something we all need at all stage of life. All stage of life. And I'm here to tell you, unfortunately, we human beings, we tend to take ourselves, our own selves for granted. Instead of being intentional about growth and development. Complete a statement for me. Any living organism that stops growing begins to die die if whenever you feel that like you reach the peak and that's it where's the next way to go down down <laughs> have a personal development plan and anybody who take this program you will be given a template the personal development plan develop you know the word kaizen is a japanese word for continuous improvement continuous improvement this should be our mindset. How can I be better every time? How can I be better? You know, in my younger years, people say to me, hey, how are you doing? And I would say, I'm getting better. And then they would say, what happened? Were you sick? I didn't know you were sick. I said, no, that's just my way. I'm always looking for a way to get better. I'm getting better. I'm never satisfied. The moment you satisfy, you become complacent, you start going downhill. Kaizen, personal development plan. Albert Einstein, and hey, Richard, would you read that for me? We should take care not to make the intellect our God. It has, of course, powerful muscles, but no personality. It cannot lead, it can only serve. And this is Albert Einstein, one of the men with the highest IQ ever. And this is what he's saying. Do you believe? Do you believe? So questions, thoughts, feedback. Let me go here. Okay, people, everybody still awake? Nobody fall asleep, right? Yeah. What were okay. you leading? <laughs> yeah you you know what lincoln this is this is mike mike brooks um, yes mike it's uh you know it's come to my attention that uh i really do need this program and um i've done it personally but uh you know right now i want to be able to do this for uh for my business 
and uh, to be able to uh, to have a plan that uh, my business can can go ahead and and and, uh, and succeed and and have all the right tools in place for us to uh, to expand it. Even though when I when I leave, uh, I want this to be um, uh, as a company culture, uh, something that me and my daughter can build on right now and uh, take this into the future. Amen. Amen. If you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always done. Any other thoughts, feedback? Uh, I think if I may. Yes, of course, Butcher. Yeah, we speak about change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Since, since early January, February, we have been forced to change. I know. Right. And, and our environment has changed. Every company has been impacted. Yep. How will we manage that is, is, is very critical. We see um, suicidal rates going up, mm -hmm. even in the army. Mm. Uh, it's all a question of managing the change, and we really have to be taught how to manage that, especially yes, when it moves rapidly. Yes, sir. And so I think I think this is more relevant now than it ever was, and and we really have to change to a new normal, which means we now have to determine what it is that we are changing to, and consciously change it. And every company has to change the way it does things. So I think this is a very very timely. Program. Thank you, Bertha. But you know, the other thing, another dimension, people need the Lord more during these times than times before. And unfortunately, people who don't know Jesus, they have no choice. But those of us who know him, know we can go to him. He's our way maker. He's our shepherd. He's our protector. And that equips us and gives us the power to deal with what's going on and gives us the hope because people commit suicide when they lose hope. I love that song, All My Hope is in Jesus. All my hope is in Jesus. Any other thoughts, questions? Yes, uh, Lincoln. Um, to, t to continue from where Butchell was talking about change, I think that, um, are you hearing me? Um, yes. Okay. Um, I think that what we are faced most with at this time is this change, right? And managing change is not so simple. It is not simple at all. Now, when you said, uh, the, the, I think the, fra the, the phrase was catalyzing change, right? Yes. That would mm -hmm. Yeah. Using change in the best way to make the best of whatever you have in a more meaningful way in changing your life to 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 um to manage not only to manage but it, it you will get personal change there as well at least i feel that personally you will change your own person will change uh, behaviors even to some extent a little bit your personality but like you said um it needs something sometimes a little stronger um, than what the person himself or herself is capable of understanding and bringing to change. Um, am I confusing you? No, you're not. Yeah, but I just want to remind you, this is not a change seminar. It's a social no, no, emotional intelligence introduction right. and when we That's do the individual program then we can dig deeper into the change remember tonight was just to give you an overview i understand yeah i understand yeah. but it, 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 to me it drives home the need for um, emotional and, 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 and intellectual intelligence and that's why and i'm doing this that's it, why it, i'm doing it, this it, and it, um, solidifies that that, that, that the need for this kind of, like you call it, a, a set of skills. Yes. Um, otherwise, without those skills, without your learning those skills, like you say, uh, you, you need the whole package. You understand? The, um, um, yes, I do. Social and emotional intelligence. That's, that's how I feel, that this is 
a really important set of skills to, to achieve, to, as you say, to, 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 uh, as you call it this, what do you call it, social emotional? Social and emotional intelligence profile, profile. yes. Profile. And, and you know, every one of those components is measurable, coachable and learnable, everyone, everyone. So any other questions, thoughts before we wrap up? Uh, Mr. Kokaram? Yes, Elizabeth. Hi. Um, just want to go back to relationship management and the components. Yes. And I don't know why, but when you were talking about that, if you really study the life of Jesus mm -hmm. and you look at his character, you can see he encompasses all of this. Amen. And to me, if, if I mean, for those of us who believe in him, you know, if we really follow his ways, we would be able to communicate. We will have interpersonal effectiveness. We would be powerful, influencing leaders and inspirational leaders. We would, you know, push the status quo and catalyze the change. You know, we could do all of these things, you know, if we really and truly follow in Jesus. And that, that thought just came to me while we were doing that. Well, that's the Holy Spirit guiding you and leading you. He the way, ex <laughs> he the way example. He came to show us a way and example. And you know, that's why I like the, the Holy Bible, B-I-B-L-E, basic yes. instructions before leaving earth. That's our guide. That's our guide, but he has other equip other people to guide us along the way. You know, remember he, when he told Philip to go and stand on the wayside and this eunuch was reading the Bible and he couldn't understand and he, he stopped and Philip said, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, no, but can you help me? Uh, voila. Similarly, that's what I world. Fortunately, I am blessed with this knowledge and this experience to facilitate this program. And I'm, because of my love for people and because I don't have a lot of overhead, I can offer a really deep discount on the program. And if you're interested in having it done, just email me and we will have a one-on-one -on -one discussion. And we can talk more about it before you make a final decision. Okay, any other questions, comments? Yes, I did not get your email address. Okay, I'll give it to you in a second. All right, so we go back here. Go back here. So questions? We, Feedback. How was this for you, people? Mm -hmm. Was it a good time for you? Did you get what you expected or more than what you expected? Because that was my intention to give you more than what you expect. Um, well, I, I, yeah. Okay. I got more than I expected. Thank you. You, you asked how we felt coming in. Yes. Well, you should ask how we feel going out. Yeah, All right, yeah. Butchel, you asked the, ask the question. <laughs> I agree. Satisfied. Satisfied. I mean, okay. expectant and leaving satisfied. Thank you. Thank you. So, yes, somebody was going to say something? Yeah, this is Diana. And I. Hey, my friend. What I, one of the things I noticed, and, and this will, this, this often happens sometimes when you when you take different different programs and things like that, especially when it comes to you know when we were talking about uh, you know in, in relationship management and you know, one of the things you know that when you're talking about integrity. So for me, integrity is always like always being on time, always being prepared. And what sometimes I notice, like for example, I started 30 minutes late, right? Because <laughs> when I in my Outlook calendar, I didn't change the time from Eastern to Central. Oh, so I, okay. I was really out of integrity with myself for not <laughs> for not being on time. So I noticed that a lot of the times when you're when you're looking to you know to to take a, a course like this, that 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 sometimes you have all kinds of breakdowns before you have breakthroughs. And so I just wanted to share that because I thought I'm really having this breakdown in integrity. <laughs> and and I really get that that uh, this course could be very beneficial in having in, in having breakthroughs. Thank you, Diana. And you are practicing say do co. That's right. <laughs> you said you were going to join us, right? Yes. And you communicating why you were late. 
Some people would not even think about that. But because of you, and I know you, because of your, your sense of integrity, it behoves you to explain. That's integrity. Any other comments? Red. Yes, say do co. Say S A Y. S A Y. Say do and do D O C O. Right. Say do say what you're going. Say what you're going to do. Do what you said you were going to do, and communicate when you can't. That's right. I thank you. I just wanted to make sure I had it right. Okay. Say do. Right. Let me know if there's anything else I can help you with. Okay, um, I'm going to ask you to complete this statement for me. Everybody unmute yourself. Complete this statement. Practice makes perfect. 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 And you know, and you know, that's what we've been taught since we were kids. Practice makes perfect. But if we are practicing uh -huh. the if we are practicing the wrong way of doing it, something we're going to become perfectly good at doing it wrong. Okay. Yes. Practice makes permanent. That's why it's so important that we become aware of what am I practicing? Am I practicing the right way of doing this? Am I practicing the right way? And that's why we need tools like the social and emotional intelligence profile to point us in the right way. Practice makes permanent. And I hope you're writing that down in your great idea sheet. So, all can, I, can I add something to that? Yes, sir. Lincoln? Yes, Rich. I, when I was doing sales training, I would tell them, you don't practice until you get it right. You practice until you cannot get it wrong. Yes, sir. I like it. I like that. Thank you. So, our beliefs would impact the judgments we make and the decisions we make. And the judgments we make and the decisions we make would impact the actions we take or not take. For example, I, I am assuming, forgive me for assuming, but I'm assuming that all of you drive. So you're driving down the road and you're doing a pretty decent miles per hour and you, there's a traffic light about 100 yards ahead of you and the light is green. If you believe that that light will continue to be green, you will speed up, Yeah. right? If you believe the light is going to change, you will slow down, I hope. Well, some people, yeah. that's why they, you know, they run red lights. So your, our beliefs impact the judgments we make, the decisions we make, and the actions we take or not take. And the actions we take or not take would impact the results we achieve or not achieve. Yeah. which would validate what we believe in the first place. So if you are one of those, I hope none of you are, are sitting down here thinking this is just psychological mumbo jumbo, this is not going to work for me, you're going to decide you're not going to do anything about it and just continue going on as you're going on. But if you believe, wow, this is amazing, and I can benefit from this, you will take action. And I'm, I'm here to help you take action. That's my role, to help you take action. We will find a way, if you really want to do this, we'll find a way for you to get it done. I have a pastor in India from a very poor community in the you know, small village. And we were able to get a sponsorship for him to have his done. So we'll find a way. God will provide a way if you decide that you want to get this done. So here's my contact information, Gita. You were looking at it. Um, my, my email is lincoln at hisbusinesspartners.com. You can go to my website, www.hisbusinesspartners.com and get my whole story right there. But my email is lincoln at hisbusinesspartners.com. Everybody got it? Yes, thanks. All right. Gita, did you get my email? Yes, Deborah, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So let me go back here and stop sharing. All right, people. But that brings us to the, to the end 
Um, anybody have any good night statements? Well, Mr. Kokaram, this was certainly not what I expected. This has blown me out. You know, I am mind blown as they say. So thank you very much for this. You're welcome, Liz. You're very welcome. What part of Trinidad are you from? Um, Central. Okay. So yes, you... I got the um, I got the link via SATC. Yes, yes. She. Yeah. Thank the Reverend Joy. You know, she's an action person. Yes, she's she an is. Action person. I can vouch for that. She's an action person. She and I are communicating, and you know, I, I'm just a sower of the seed, people. I'm just sowing the seed. So the ball is in your court. And if you would like to have your social and emotional intelligence profile done, and this is not a one-time thing. When you engage with me, we become friends for life. We become friends for life because learning is not an event. It's a process. It's not an event, it's a process. So you have my contact information. I hope to hear from you. I will ask for you to continue to pray for our world, our country, and all our friends and our relatives that this too, we know and believe this too shall pass. The Lord is already working on fixing this for us. He's just testing our faith. And he's entitled to do that because he is God. He is the creator. We are the creation, you know. I didn't tell him to put me in Trinidad. I didn't tell him to make me skinny, you know, and dark skin. I didn't tell him to do that. He chose to do that, and hallelujah, Jesus. I love it. Praise his name in all things. Seek him when you're lost, when you don't know. Seek his way. He, the, one of my favorite songs of late is We Maker by Matthew West. Google it and listen to it. He's our way maker. He is. He will not disappoint us. My mission in life is to help as many people as possible to be the best that they were designed to be. Too many of us are settling for okay and we're disappointing our Heavenly Father. And he's going to tell you, I did not make you to be okay. I made you in my image to be great. Go, my friends, and be great. Thank you. Have a good night. And I look forward to hearing from you. Good night. Bye. Good night, good everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good thank you. Thank you. And remember, it's Lincoln. Lincoln. <laughs> Five, four, three, two, one. Bye -bye. Bye. 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 Hey, Christine Bye. and Sunil, good to see you. <laughs> yeah. Great to be here. All right. Bye, Richard. Say hi to Denise for me. Yeah. All right. Bye bye. I don't want to hang up on anybody. Okay. Bye. There you go.